centro de Seattle. No estamos lejos del centro de Seattle, pero el transporte ha sido un caos. I, I live in South Park for 12 years and I have always used public transportation, um, but one of the most problematic issues that I find is the transportation from South Park to downtown Seattle. Y yo considero que si estamos dentro del área de Seattle, tenemos los derechos de tener el mejor transporte y los mejores servicios porque todo el mundo paga los impuestos y tenemos derecho a los impuestos que pagamos como comunidad latina. Siento que a veces nos están aislando un poco porque en otros lugares tienen hasta cuatro buses que están al servicio de la comunidad y South Park únicamente tiene el, el bus 60 que nos conecta con Georgetown y con uh, Beacon Hill para el, lo que es el, el tren, pero uh, no hay otros buses. El 132 es otro bus que pasa, pero no con frecuencia. Y el 124 es una línea de bus rápida, pero nos queda un poco lejos de lo que es el centro de South Park. Uh -huh. Yo tengo que uh, tomar el 124, perdón, 124 y caminar hasta mi casa, que está en la segunda avenida en South Park, más de 17 blocks. Uh -huh. um, so I'm going to kind of say all that. <laughs> So Luis is talking about um, his experience with public transportation being really difficult and many times him noticing that he, many Latino communities in the Duwamish Valley have that, are experiencing that inequity because he notices that in different neighborhoods, there is way more transportation options or more routes of metros passing by while here in South Park, we only have two routes, one being the 132 taking you to downtown Seattle, the other one being the 60, which takes you to White Center, Beacon Hill. And we also have the 124, which is all the way in Georgetown. And for Luis, him stating that he lives on South Park, it takes him around 17 blocks of walking to get to the 124, um, which is all the way in Georgetown to be able to transport to different areas. Okay, my pregunta is, ¿Tienen ustedes algún plan estratégico para mejorar la transportación? Por ejemplo, pensando una conexión de Buring hacia el centro de Seattle. Uh, vamos a hacer una comparación, quizá no es buena, pero si vamos a Portland, Portland tiene muchos trenes y diferentes conexiones a muchos lugares. Seattle, siendo una ciudad tan grande, mucho más grande que Portland, no he visto que haya una línea de tren que conecte a todos los sectores que vayan hacia el centro de Seattle. Ahorita también tenemos la, la línea de tren que conecta a la, el CITA, el aeropuerto al centro de Seattle o a la universidad. Y sé que están trabajando en una extensión de tren hacia el, el mall de Nor Norbent okay. y otra línea para Bellevue. Pero mi pregunta es, ¿habrá alguna conexión de building que beneficie a White Center directamente al centro de Seattle en el futuro, porque si hay una línea de tren que pasa por South Park, sería excelente porque teníamos el mejor servicio. South Park estaría conectado a la ciudad de Seattle. Los negocios tendrían más este, comercio y South Park sería un pequeño pueblito, como le llamamos así, el pueblito de South Park, pero con más desarrollo. Uh -huh. So my question to you guys now is what strategies do you have brainstormed to better have transportation for communities small like ours? Uh, one of the examples I want to give you is that Seattle is such a big city and yet I, I, I'm sorry to compare it to a different city which is Portland but Portland has um, so many transportation options that connects all their routes, all their small neighborhoods to the downtown area. So how can we provide something similar including Bureau and connecting those to downtown Seattle, um, I am aware of the link station and the train that passes by and we're starting to create more stops, but how can we connect more to smaller neighborhoods that will bring more economic prosperity to our local businesses and bring all those little small town neighborhoods that we consider like our home, more income and more um, transportation. Ok, siento que a veces la comunidad de South Park está marginada. ¿Por qué? Vivimos en un lugar contaminado, donde el aire de South Park está contaminado y tenemos la biblioteca más pequeña en South Park. En otros lugares hay una biblioteca con dos pisos, con salón de conferencias, pequeños salones para reuniones y South Park únicamente tenemos una pequeña biblioteca. A esto se le suma la problemática del transporte. Y mi pregunta es, ¿qué tan limpios están los buses actualmente que estamos en pandemia? Nos subimos al bus 
y estamos con un desafío si el bus fue desinfectado. Yo veo en el bus algunas mascarillas, pero no veo gel, gel de manos. O, por ejemplo, asegurarme que el asiento donde yo estoy sentado está limpio. So I really believe that South Park is marginalized because of several factors that I want to state. One of them being that we are surrounded by a super fun site, meaning that we have one of the highest polluted neighborhoods, but also being that we have one of the smallest library, public library in, in the in the Seattle areas, which I noticed that there's other neighborhoods that have public libraries with two floors or more, but that also adding that transportation, there's a lack of transportation and also thinking now of COVID, when, how, what type of procedures are we taking? How are our buses being cleaned? Many times when I use a public transit here in South Park, I notice that, yes, we are, we must wear masks, but I still don't see no hand disinfecting or any hand sanitizer provider for people that come in. Many times I have to worry about if my seat has been disinfected or if other people have touched it. Um, and again, we only have two routes, so I have no other options but to continue to using this transportation. ¿Les gusta agregar más o es todo? Ok, sí, simplemente agradecer específicamente a ti por la interpretación español-inglés. Mi inglés no es tan bueno, pero este, gracias por ayudarme y también por invitarme a compartir la historia de lo que es uh, el transporte y qué tan limpios están los buses, tenemos duda pero pienso que mi intervención pueda servir de algo para tener una visión hacia el futuro de cómo mejorar el transporte y cómo nuestro eh, servicio público o la transportación esté uh, pues muy limpio, asegurarnos que no nos vamos, bueno, de que nos vamos a contaminar, nos vamos a contaminar siempre, pero al menos asegurarnos que está limpio el bus que vamos a, a tomar. Muchas gracias a todos y éxitos en todo. Gracias, Mario. All right, thank, gracias Luis. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you Maggie for translating, but also thank everyone that's here today for allowing me to give a little bit of my experience with public transportation. Um, I know there's a lot of questions about sanitizing buses and um, transportation around the Seattle area, specifically the Duwamish Valley, but I hope I bring some awareness to you about what's occurring. Um, and once again, thank you for allowing me the time. Gracias, Luis. Gracias, Maggie. Thank you very much to both of you for being here today and for uh, providing your time and your expertise in, uh, in your community. Um, you're raising some really important questions uh, around how do we ensure people have uh, access to the mobility that they need? How do we make sure people live in communities that promote good health? Um, and also what is the state's responsibility in providing these things? And so I want to turn now to some of the staff members who are working in our coalition um, to talk about uh, what we are advocating for from our state government. Um, I want to introduce Leah who works for Climate Solutions and Adrian who works with Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition to tell you more about our clean and just transportation platform and what is going on um, right now at our state legislature. Fantastic, thank you all so much for being with us. Again, my name is Adrian. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm with the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition, where I also have the great honor of working with um, Maggie and Luis in community on these very urgent and important issues. Uh, some of this work um, includes working with the Clean and Just, Pretend, just sorry, clean and just transportation table. Just to recap what, what that is and who we are, the Climate Alliance hosts the clean and just transportation table, representing labor unions, community of color-based organizations, mobility, health, and environmental organizations. Together, we are working to pass strong statewide transportation policies that build a clean and equitable transportation system for all by reducing climate pollution, improving community health and economic opportunity, and creating sustainable alternatives to congestion management. I saw on the chat, someone mentioned the West Seattle Bridge closure. So when we talk about congestion management, that's exactly what we're talking about. 
we fundamentally believe transportation solutions must be built by those who are impacted by pollution, economic injustice, to ensure we create a transportation system that reduces harms like pollution and or displacement in order to increase affordability, safety, equitable access, good jobs, clean air, and clean water, all these things that are basic human rights and should not be reliant on your zip code, race, or ethnicity, income level, um, and, and all of those things. In this way, uh, transportation justice is integral to advancing climate justice. So what is our transportation um, uh, Washington's transportation funding and um, current forecasting look like. So Washington State is spending transportation funding in the wrong ways. It's heav heavily focused on a gas tax, which is restrictive, restricted to highway spending um, by the 18th Amendment, and a gas tax is also highly regressive. Not only is transportation funding declining, Washington State continues to overwhelmingly prioritize spending, um, spending our limited revenue on new roads and highway expansion, which then increases the car congestion displacement, stalling progress towards a just transition, and instead driving more harmful pollution into our air and water. We can and must do better to build a transportation system that is clean and aligns with our spending, in lines with our spending with state transportation goals of safety, health, and equity, as I spoke to before. These goals must be made a priority. More so, our current transportation system creates an unequal and adverse outcomes. And this unmet need stacks up to billions of dollars, presenting major gaps in transit, walking and biking infrastructure, as well as maintenance backlog for those things that keep us safe every day. This leads to a lack of healthy mobility, getting to A and B safely in an efficient manner, contributes to a climate crisis by releasing um, emissions into the air, as well as public health impacts, such as poor air quality from fine particulate matter that's not good for us to breathe in, as well as lack of access to getting to good jobs, education, and the communities that we need to lean on during hard times. It's really important to our social safety net. Because of this, our state transportation funding needs to be progressive, stable, and also factor in the social determinants of health. So in this way, a just transportation system would benefit everyone. We believe we can start turning the curve on pollution and injustice with the next transportation package. This is an urgent need. So you might be thinking, what is a transportation package? So a transportation package is the state's way of funding new projects and policies by identifying new revenue sources and a suite of investments. The last package was called Connecting Washington, as you may recall, in 2015. In past packages, investments have been heavily um, made into roads and highway expansions and only 5% into transit, walking and biking. This is just simply not enough. So what is the process to pass the package that we want for clean and just transportation? Well, it typically takes several years of negotiations and, to play it out. Um, there's people on this call working very hard to do that as we speak. Transportation committee leaders put forth their proposals, then they are in hearings and negotiations, um, just like other bills. And it's very complicated because these bills are long and robust, um, and there's a lot of details that go into them. For example, the House proposal is, uh, as we heard, 26 billion over 16 years. So we are hoping that the package comes together, that comes together, um, there are several proposals out there, but a lot has to happen in order for it to all come together by April 25th. That's basically a month from now. Um, and this is also the end of session. So on the revenue side, current issues at play look like road usage charge. Um, this is being discussed and we wanna make sure that this is progressive, that there's um, equity at the core and it's being considered um, to the fullest degree, as well as tiered pricing and that this revenue raised is flexible, not just limited on highways. In addition, carbon pricing um, 
carbon pricing is some of the funds that will be needed to pass transportation package. We are supporting some new novel sources like Senator Saldana's air quality surcharge, which puts a fee on cars at point of sale based on how much they would pollute. So overall, an equitable transportation system will create positive shared outcomes. And on the investment side, we wanna see things like number one, things that reduce vehicle miles traveled. So um, this means that people can get out of their cars and use different ways of getting around and stuff that transition us to clean transportation like electric buses, even electric school buses. Um, and this all will require strong support for transit, like walking and biking and being connected. Um, electrification, especially large fleets of vehicles, especially stormwater mitigation and culverts, and at least 35% of investments going to impact communities for projects. Also, do you want to turn it over to me, Adrian? now? Yes, you and now I'll pass it over to Leah. Cool. <laughs> Just making sure. Um, okay, so I will dive in a little bit on um, some of the sort of data details behind what Adrian was talking about, and also to sort of provide a little bit of background um, that really affirms the stories that we're hearing from community members, and also affirms what Kelsey was talking about earlier, about how we really need to do everything in order to have a truly clean and truly just transportation system. We cannot continue to pit needs up against each other. So um, this is a lot of data on this slide, but I'll, I'll go through it. Basically what it says is that in order to meet our climate goals, we have to electrify basically all of the vehicles that are on the road. And in addition to that, we need to increase transit access. We need to reduce the amount that folks have to get around in their personal vehicles only in order to make it so this transition is just, so people have transportation options, they can get to where they need to go in an easy way. And in order to better um, uh, produce um, outcomes like saving lives as a, as a result of reduced car crashes and having more near-term health benefits. So, um, what this slide shows is, is sort of two possibilities that we could, we could move forward with. On the left, you see what happens if we reduce BMT significantly, vehicle miles traveled significantly, and also electrify the vehicles that remain on the road. On the right shows what happens if we basically just electrify, but don't really make any attempt at changing our mobility patterns. Um, we don't expand transit. We don't expand walking and biking options, et cetera. And you can see that we meet our climate goals in both ways, but when we combine these strategies, when we combine increasing transit access and walking and biking access with electrification, we see even more benefits. So folks will save more money on getting around um, in, in sort of an electrification only scenario. Compared to the status quo, this is better. Folks will save about $1,800 per year on their transportation costs by 2050. But if we combine that with expanding transit access or avoiding the need to drive and instead being able to walk and bike, we can have folks saving over $4,000 per year um, by 2050 under this. In addition, we'll see more near-term health benefits as we expand access to transit and walking and biking. And um, those air pollutants that Adrian was talking about, not only climate pollution, but particulate matter that gets into our lungs and is really harmful to our health. As we shift away from vehicles, that um, is further reduced. And then finally, um, folks are, are, you know, there's, there's a real problem with folks who are being killed um, in car crashes. And we actually see the data shows that mostly BIPOC communities are impacted by this. And so the more that we can, again, reduce the vehicle miles traveled, move folks over to safe transit options, safe walking and biking, we will actually save lives. And when you combine, or when you compare these two strategies, um, of course, we'll need to spend more on transit, we'll need to improve transit access and that, that will take um, money, but we'll have to spend less on roads due to less wear and tear um, from, from so many vehicles. And um, we'll also have to spend money on um, building out our electricity system in order to um, power these vehicles with clean electricity. But all that to say is when you compare these two things together, the combined strategy actually is slightly cheaper than if we only rely on electrification. So I just wanted to put some data out there about how we really need to pursue both strategies. And I also wanna emphasize that when we're talking about transportation, we're not only talking about personal mobility, but we're also talking about freight, we're talking about garbage trucks, we're talking about buses, we're talking about all these different kinds of vehicles that move through communities. We wanna make sure those are clean, 
And we want to make sure that everybody has the access to get around in the way that works best for them. So again, expanding transit and expanding um, safe walking, rolling options. Um, so in sum, we need to electrify our transportation system. We need to switch to cleaner fuels, but we also need to do a lot more. We need to reduce the vehicle miles we travel and have more folks who are able to use active transportation, like rolling in some form or walking. We, we need to have folks who are able to use transit, like Luis was mentioning, not all communities have good transit access that really needs to be expanded. So we're really working on that. And all rolled up together, we'll see significant reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions. We'll see re significant reduction in the air pollutants that harm our health. Um, we will need less infrastructure if we have a combined strategy, um, combining VMT reductions, vehicle miles traveled reductions with electrification, and we'll see fewer deaths from crashes. So we really need to, we really need to work on a transportation package that looks at all of these things together. Um, so next slide, please. So um, basically, um, overall, like Adrian was mentioning, we, we are looking at the transportation packages that will be forthcoming as a group to make sure that we are seeing investments in transit, investments in safe walking and, and pedestrian um, infrastructure, um, safe investments in biking infrastructure, safe routes to school, and in transportation electrification, especially for heavier duty vehicles that are, are um, more expensive and harder to electrify at this very moment but would lead to significant pollution reductions. So right now we have a couple of different packages on the table, just like um, Adrian mentioned. And, and just to reiterate for folks to know, um, right now it looks like the house package um, is the package that was $26 billion over 16 years. Um, it did provide more of what we wanted to see, um, not enough, but more of what we wanted. And so we're really working hard to sort of um, amplify the things we like in that package and help expand them. Um, on the Senate side, their package proposal was a little bit less. It was about $18 billion over 16 years, and there's a few different proposals out there. We don't have the details on those proposals just yet. We're expecting some significant details this week, and as a group, we're going to be working together, again, to advocate for those investments we need and also make sure that we're paying for those investments in a way that is um, both climate friendly, climate forward and progressive and just um, because we wanna make sure that we're investing in a just and clean system, but also that we're um, doing so in a way that um, the revenue is, is, um, is climate friendly and is progressive. So I will leave it at that. Fantastic, thank you to you both so much for lending your expertise. Um, I think we're gonna, spend the next 10 minutes or so just an answering some, going through some questions that have come up in, up in the chat. Again, if you have a question that you wanted to, wanted to ask, please drop it in the chat box. And um, if we can't get to it today, we can always try to follow up with you later. Um, I think, you know, one of the first questions that came up, we've been talking a lot about um, public transit and the need to get people out of private vehicles and into transit to reduce emissions, but also to provide more transit options um, for to increase access for people who rely on transit. Um, can you talk about, you know, what, uh, what in the clean and just platform gets at that transit access issue and what, you know, what can be done um, to really promote, uh, promote the use of transit across the state? And I think um, I'll go for go for Leah. And if you would like backup, we also have uh, Hester Sarabrin uh, from Transportation Choices to talk about transit issues as well. Yeah, sure. So increasing transit across the state is definitely super important. And there's a, there's a number of things here. One is that we just need more investment in a transit system, and that's in terms of you know capital investments to make sure we have more transit vehicles out there. We also need investments in service and operations dollars because you know we could have um, a lot of routes, but if they're running very infrequently, um, they don't have very many service hours. That's not useful for folks either, right? Not everybody can plan around you know um, waiting an hour for their bus to come, for example. So it's it's a combined strategy, and we also want to make sure that when we're talking about transit, we're not only talking about in the urban core. That's very important, but a lot of folks do live outside the urban core or don't necessarily live super close to their jobs. So we wanna make sure that transit is available even in small towns or in rural areas um, 
Of course, um, what exactly that system looks like can vary, right? Like in Seattle, we'll probably have, we'll have a combination of um, trains, the light rail and of buses, right? And in other areas, it might look a little bit different. But all that to say is we wanna make sure that everybody who um, wants to use transit or who needs to use transit has the ability to access um, a transit system that works for them. Again, that provides the service levels that they need and provides the routes that they need both. So that, that does take a lot of investment and that's what we're working really hard on when it comes to revenue for a package. How do we pay for this? We wanna make sure that um, we are investing significant amounts of dollars in multimodal. And, and like Adrian mentioned before, one of our barriers right now is that a huge portion of our um, transportation revenue coming into the state comes from the gas tax. And right now, the gas tax is restricted funding under the 18th Amendment of the state constitution. It has to be spent on highway purposes. And currently the belief is that cannot be spent on transit. So we're working in this area where transit really has a smaller bucket of money um, to pull from to be used for these investments. And we're really trying to open that more broadly and find revenue sources that are flexible that can be used in these multimodal investments. Um, but yeah, feel free to add on uh, Kelsey or Hester or, or folks who are in the transit community. I think you did a fantastic job. I think the other thing we we're looking at in terms of access is for the state to support um, transit affordability programming. So, you know, some local agencies have gone fare free or have found local funding to provide um, income based transit fares. Um, we want to see the, the state helping uh, support that type of access as well. Um, all right, I'm gonna to move to a new topic. Um, Adrian, you had mentioned the road usage charge as a potential new revenue source for transportation. And I think just some questions about what does, um, you know, what does a fair road usage charge policy look like? Is that possible? Um, you know, what happens with, you know, people who must drive who are in rural areas who might drive longer? Um, what are some of the sort of policy principles that we're using to, to guide our advocacy around a potential road usage charge. Thanks, Kelsey. I'd be happy to start us off. Um, and I, I also know that this is a topic that um, a lot of folks are interested in hearing. So uh, first and foremost, I would say, you know, is, is equitable road usage uh, charge possible? And I think that's a huge question mark. Um, there are examples in other states, and in fact, Clean and Just um, did a webinar a couple months ago um, to this regard. So if you're interested in checking out that webinar, please um, look that one up. Maybe someone can drop a link in the chat. Um, but what needs to also be considered is that not everyone travels at the same time of the day. Um, and so um, things like um, timing, what cars would be charged. Um, these are these are two examples that, you know, when we start looking at the nitty gritty details and how a road usage charge is structured, then we can start ask, asking these questions of what is equitable, um, who um, and who, um, uh, how can we lift the burden of this policy? Um, from where I come from and um, uh, many, many friends of mine uh, do believe that when they hear the concept of road, road usage charge, they'll say, this isn't for me, this is going to harm me. And so I think we also need to acknowledge um, past harms and how that's rolled into future policies in which we suggest and we must acknowledge those and make sure that um, those harms are reconciled, but also healed and we move forward in a more progressive way. Um, it, in in that we do not further um, uh, burden communities who contribute the least to the problems and are just trying to get to work. Um, so first and foremost, I would just love to say that. Um, and um, I would love to also pass it over to Hester. Hester, do you, um, would you like to add on to anything about the road usage charts that I just talked about? You did a really good job. Plus, I was searching for the uh, link to the video of the chat, so I just dropped that in there. So sorry if I repeat anything you say, but I think um, I think you're absolutely right. Like, not starting from a baseline like this is the solution or this is bad, but really evaluating how it could be formed. It's a brand new way to approach pricing, and I think that gives us a lot of flexibility in shaping it from the get go. And so another thing that we're working on is just looking at where where pricing happens at all levels of government, right? There's local congestion pricing conversations, there's tolling, there's road usage pricing at the state. How do we make sure everyone's talking to, get to each other so we're also not doubly tapping folks for engagement on this? 
um, but ensuring that there's a lot of transparency and efficiency in how the system is set up to begin with. Thanks, Adrian. Great, thank you so much for diving into those topics. I will chime in with my own addition, which is that you know one of the most important priorities for our coalition and a road usage charge is that you know if implemented, we want to make sure the money that comes from that is flexible because right now the money that uh, we raise from the gas tax is inflexible. It can only be spent um, building and maintaining highways, and we know that we need to be able to use many strategies to make our transportation uh, system cleaner and more accessible, not just building uh, and maintaining roads. So we wanna see uh, flexible, flexible revenue raised from any road usage charge that moves forward. Okay, we have a couple more minutes. Um, Leah, there were a few specific questions about your um, electrification slides and I know there's a whole report that uh, you know backs that up so people can dive into the full report as well but I'll try to get to just a couple of these questions um, in Leah's slides does 100% electricity assume all electricity is from hydro and if not what other sources and impacts are considered yeah so the modeling for our electricity sector was based off of um, the clean energy transformation act which passed in 2019 that requires that by 2045 all electricity in washington is fossil fuel free so it's a really exciting policy that um, a lot of us worked on in the climate alliance and so that those are the constraints that the policy was modeled under um, it includes existing hydro it does not include any new um, large-scale hydro um, per what was passed in 2019. Great. Next question. Um, so compared to the electrification only scenario, are the CO2 two reductions the same or greater with electrification plus vehicle miles traveled? Yeah, so when you do um, the, both strategies sort of get us to a similar endpoint, which we were aiming for at least a 95% reduction in um, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 for this model. But the cumulative emissions over time under the strategy, when you paired electrification with reducing vehicle miles traveled, the cumulative emissions under that strategy were lower because it does take time to electrify the full fleet. Whereas if you um, have, with, when you pair that with those vehicle mile travels reductions, um, especially earlier on, you see more greenhouse gas emissions averted and more air pollution averted. So the combined strategy was better for cumulative emissions, even though they both got us to that sort of same endpoint. Great, and then one more question about electrification. Is the, is the coalition advocating for specific uh, financial support for transit and bus electrification? Maybe you could talk um, generally about sort of our approach for how to prioritize electrification in transportation. Yeah, for sure. So um, as a coalition, we are focused on um, those applications that really do need um, the push, which is heavier duty and medium duty on um, vehicles that includes transit. Um, but it also includes things like garbage trucks, our larger trucks, um, the infrastructure investments, and also the upfront cost of electrification for those sectors is higher than it is for personal vehicles. So just overall, we're working on providing extra support to those harder to electrify sectors right now. And also we're looking at how do we help lower income folks um, better access um, transportation electrification too. So um, we're really excited in 2019, a bill was passed that we worked on that um, provided um, green transit grants um, for transit agencies um, to convert their buses to battery electric buses. So that was really exciting. And, and those grants were quickly snatched up. Um, so we would love to see more along the same lines. Um, we also are advocating th for things like a charge ahead program where folks would be able to exchange in um, a, a, a more polluting used vehicle and be able to exchange that in for um, a used electric vehicle or perhaps a transit pass. So funding for those programs, in addition to things like workforce training and then the infrastructure um, needed for heavier duty um, transportation electrification. Um, and then I will note, I also noticed in the chat a question about a couple of bills um, and a few of our organizations are working really hard on the clean fuel standard, which would also provide a revenue source for transit agencies to electrify. Fantastic. Thank you for those uh, that information and everyone for your questions. I know we didn't get to every question. Um, I did see one a little bit more about um, the process moving forward for these negotiations and how, you know, the pace at which we can expect updates on the transportation package discussions. And we will 
touch on that at the end of the webinar. Um, but now I wanted to turn back to community. Um, we have Crystal here with the um, Disability Rights Washington Mobility, Dis uh, excuse me, um, Disability Rights Washington. And she's going to speak um, about her perspectives on mobility. So Crystal, I'm going to hand it over to you. Hey, my name is Crystal Monteros. Um, so I've been taking public transportation um, probably since I was in the seventh, eighth grade, maybe. Um, and I started taking it in California, then Colorado, and now over here. And my opinion, it's, it's weird because it's different everywhere. And even in Washington state, like I live in Tacoma, it's different in Tacoma than it is like in Kent than it is in Seattle. You know, um, and one thing that I really wanted to touch on, especially based off of this particular discussion, it's like whether you're in a rural area or like an urban area, like there's people with disabilities everywhere. Like you can't just say that uh, people with disabilities, and mind you, I'm speaking for like specifically wheelchair users, you know, like, but you can't just say they're in a certain location, you know, like, oh, we got that area covered and so we're good. Which in my opinion, that just is what, from working with like the, the people I've worked with, it just seems like they think like, oh, that's good enough because we put them over there, you know? But with me, it's like, yeah, you put them over there, but I wanna go over there too, you know? So, <laughs> and that just irritates me so bad because it's like the whole thing just needs to be covered because what if I want to visit a friend that lives in this area you know then you're still blocking me from that and I I say that because like I specifically have certain friends who are wheelchair users and like they can't use public transportation and it's it seems to me this is my opinion it seems to me that they're just not counted for because they're not taking public transportation currently at the moment so um, I don't know who it is, I, you know, cause I'm not in that, but I don't know if it's like the people who are doing public transportation or what, but they're just not counted for as people who take public, public transportation, you know, because they're not on public transit currently. So it's like, if they were actually able to get on the bus, then they would be counted for as people that need to be accommodated but because they're not on the bus, then they're not counted for. Does that make sense? You know, <laughs> but it's like, if there were sidewalks and curb cuts for them to actually get to the bus in the first place from their house, then all of a sudden they would be a person to be counted for. So I just wanted to speak on that in the sense of, that's one thing I've always kind of advocated for is like, public transportation is one thing that we need to accommodate for people with disabilities, but we need to combine public transportation with the sidewalks, the curb cuts, the crosswalks, the <laughs> all that stuff and make all those work. And one example for me that I wanted to touch on is like, this happened maybe like three years ago, I think here in Tacoma. I like the, the bus routes were perfectly fine for me to get to a Kmart here in Tacoma. And I made it perfectly fine to Kmart and they had like the sidewalk and everything but then the sidewalk cut out and it went into gravel. They had a crosswalk and everything to get across the street to the Kmart. And the only thing was the gravel was soft and it was raining. And I got stuck in there. I literally ended up having to call my sister to come pick me up. And I took two buses to get there, but I literally had to call my sister to come pick me up simply to take me across the street to the Kmart that I just finished taking two buses to get to, you know, like, but in my opinion, if public transportation worked with the people who did the crosswalks and the curb cuts and the, you know, sidewalks, all of this would be, it, it would all work together, you know, and it would cause us all to be independent, but yeah, I kind of wanted to speak on that and share my story on that sense and stuff and make sure that everybody knows like 
it's not just one community, it's all communities that need to be, you know, accessible to the urban and the rural areas because we're everywhere. We're not just in one community. So. Thank you, Crystal. We really appreciate your time. We re appreciate you being here and especially for sharing your story and some of your experiences. Um, Crystal participated in an amazing storytelling project. Um, I'm putting the link in the chat, but basically telling stories across Washington state about the need for better access within our transportation system. Um, Crystal, I think people, your story and, and other people's stories um, are, so, are so powerful and really needed. Um, you know, the organizing you all have been doing is incredibly important for um, advocating for, for, for change and, and a new shift at, with our state legislature. So really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to uh, turn back to the question in the chat about what are the next steps for this work. Um, as Adrian mentioned, it's a bit of a sprint to the end of the legislative session this year. Um, the last day of session is April 25th, and so we really have just a few more weeks um, to get this done this year. Um, we, we hope that it's going to happen, but we are going to all need to speak up together to um, ask for what we want. Um, tomorrow at 10 a.m. is going to be the newest update from the House. Uh, we anticipate at 10 a.m. Um, a press announcement regarding the House House's latest version of their investment package. Um, we've been waiting for months to see more details in their proposal, and so we expect that it's going to happen tomorrow. Then there is going to be public hearings uh, later this week on Thursday. Um, and so, you know, over the next several weeks, there's going to definitely be updates um, happening pretty, I think, pretty consistently and um, we're gonna be doing our best, all of our organizations and the Climate Alliance to be um, out on social media, updating our blogs, uh, updating our email lists so that um, everyone, no matter how involved you are, can keep up with the news and to um, look out for opportunities to speak up and stay engaged. Um, and I think to close out today, I, I wanted to invite some of our um, amazing field staff to tell you uh, about an action that we can take together right now, as well as um, future opportunities in the coming weeks to get involved and stay plugged in. Um, I, I really can't emphasize enough that we are all in this together. Um, we need to be working together to raise our voices um, because we have a lot of change, a lot of change to make and, and decades of, um, of spending to undo. Uh, in terms of transportation. So I'm going to ask uh, Sarah to please come off of mute and help lead us in a direct action. Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Farpstein. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an organizer at Washington Environmental Council. Um, and hopefully now that you've, you've learned more about our transportation system, and how it's failing us, you feel inspired to take action to make sure we can change that this legislative session. Um, so I'm going to pop in the chat a link um, to our action alert, and we're all going to do it together right now. Um, so I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have, have taken actions online at some point before. Um, so you're just going to pop your information in there, and then it'll come up with a message. And I encourage everyone to add a couple of sentences uh, to the pre-scripted message uh, to tell your story and why you're passionate about transportation. And then once you've done that uh, and you've completed it, it will look like this. And I'm also going to encourage everyone to share it on either Facebook or Twitter if you have a social media account um, so we can continue to spread the word and have more people take action. So if everyone, I think, on this call can do that now. I think that's about almost 300 emails um, to our legislators, which is pretty awesome. Um, so once you've done that, I'm also going to invite you to join us next Tuesday. I pop this in the chat 
myself and Ben Jones are hosting a tech night next Tuesday from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Um, and we'll be texting constituents in some of our key districts and asking them to contact their legislators for a clean and just transportation package. So it should be fun. If you haven't texted before, it's pretty easy. Um, it's a good time, there'll be music um, and fun way to, to take action. Ben, do you wanna add anything? Let me stop sharing. Looking forward to seeing you all there. Thanks for helping out today and thanks for showing your support and letting your legislators know that you want to see a clean and just transportation package. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time and your being here and for taking action with us today. Um, I'm just getting breaking news that this house proposal, these house details actually might not be coming out tomorrow at 10. They might be coming closer to Wednesday at 2 p.m. So as you can see, things are changing by the minute here. We are trying to track all of it and stay, keep everyone plugged in. Um, so we, we appreciate you staying engaged and um, we, will, we will be in touch. Thank you all. Have a wonderful Monday. Thank you all. Thank you to our speakers.